there and you have questions during the presentation and you want me to ask Jesse afterwards, put it in the chat. Um, definitely let us know. So I'm talking about Jesse Ward. A small introduction for the people that don't know him. He writes software. It's simple as that. He writes software at Capital Capital One. If I give it, he has 20 years of experience as a software developer. I, I read what you did, Jesse. Uh, it's too much to mention. You, you you did it all. You transferred. You you evolved. It's amazing. I'm not going to mention, but you have the 20 years experience. You write code front, back end, uh, and you like deploying it on AWS. You look a bit like Johnny Cash. I hope that's a compliment for you. Um, Checking him, you can't see him in the audience, but he's looking at me. I don't know if that's a compliment, but you look like Johnny Cash. Um, and you're a man of many skills. And I think the best way to sum it up is that they just check your blog because you write so much about the, com the software that you're writing on jessewarden.com and on your YouTube channel. And you're going to talk to about us today about using serverless and functional programming for ingesting meteor price data. All right. And I want to do you... Uh, Something special with you. I saw your YouTube channel, and I'm going to introduce you as you introduce yourself on your YouTube channel. So I'm going to do... <laughs> right. You forgot to All take right. it offline. You, you forgot. You're going like, oh, no, not that. So I'm going to do it. And after that, you can take the virtual floor and do your thing. So this is the introduction. Here we go. Jesse Warden. Programming. Gaming. Fitness. Jesse Warden. Take it away. <laughs> virtual floor is yours. Have fun. I appreciate it. All right. Let me... So I use the word meteor, but it's really about actually asteroids. I don't know. I, I like meteor because it sounded more fiery and more impressive than rocks in space. All right. So, and like I said, if there's any questions in the middle, I don't mind being, you stop me at any time and ask questions. I do not have to wait till the end. There's a lot of, a lot of this is beginner material. Some of it's advanced material. Some of it's very outside material. So do not mind stopping. So what we're going to talk about today is building AWS Lambda applications. And I call them serverless applications, but AWS calls them Lambda. And we're going to use an example ingestion of asteroid price data because there's a lot of data a lot of parsing and moving around different data sets from different sources. Some of them have a lot of technical debt. Some are very slow. Some are large. Some are just bad data. And parts of that example are showing how we can build a AWS a Lambda application and really think about the error handling part of it. And so that's the main part I want to cover is error handling, the skill tree about leveling up. And it's not just about leveling up to the top. It's really important to know each one of these levels so that you can use them in different situations if you're using level one to learn things level six when you're deploying a prod things like that so my name is jesse warden i'm a software developer capital one i'm forced to use python and javascript i don't really like them but i use them as a job i would prefer to use functional languages but it's a minority in the job market so i just keep trying to lead by example rather than be a wizard in the tower so when we talk about asteroid prices. What do we really mean by asteroid prices? If you think about by 2080, it's estimated that Earth will run out of natural resources. And it doesn't mean they're all gone. It just means they're really hard to get. And asteroids have a lot of precious metals in them just because uh, uh, the smaller ones, it hasn't sunk to the core. So it's a lot easier to get at them. Some of them are, are very pure but it currently costs too much to get them. So that's why a lot of scientists aren't very excited about it. Uh, the rest of us who don't really know much about mining actually are, because it seems really awesome to get 20 billion tons of gold, for example. Um, but if we invest research into it, it actually could be viable. And to give you an example of it, the sands in Alberta, Canada, back in the early 2000s, it wasn't really, it was messy. It's just a bunch of sand to get oil out of, and it wasn't really viable. But then as soon as the oil price shot up, and there's a lot of horrible political, economic, environmental, and human impacts, it was still viable because profit was there. It's, so if you think of asteroid mining that way, suddenly it's not, a, it's, it's not something we can do, but yet as soon as we run out of resources, we'll find a way to do it. And so that's where your motivation comes from. So if you give an example, this is Eros, where we sent a robot to land on it. It's estimated that it has 20 billion tons of gold and platinum. And if we were to bring that back, it'd be, let's say it's all gold. It'd be worth like 1 trillion euros or about 1 trillion USD. That's insanely awesome. Who wouldn't want that much gold? So suddenly you start thinking about these numbers and estimates how much it costs to get rockets and things to get there. 
Another example, although it's a dwarf planet, we can lump it into asteroids, would be the Ceres. And this thing is smaller than the moon, about a fourth or so, but it's like 50% water in, in theory. They, there's debate if it actually has a, a metal core. And so we could go there, get metals, but not only that, we could stay there a while because there's water not 500 you know, clicks away. And it's estimated there's about, I mean, currently 1.9 million asteroids, but there's probably a lot more, at least in, we're talking specifically the belt right outside of Earth and Mars. And so there's a lot of opportunity in, to get metals that are you know, in that general area if we have a way to quickly travel and target the ones we're getting. The Expanse TV show, completely based on this concept where Mar Earth has pretty much trashed itself and Mars is trying to build itself. And both of those planets leverage these people who live inside of the asteroid belt to get these resources for them. And so we'll, that's what asteroid prices are, is about taking these asteroids and understanding how much they're worth and how much it would cost to get there and bring that back or go there and mine it and bring it back or go there and mine it and process it and bring those materials back. However you do that, that's, that's what we're talking about from price data. So from an AWS Lambda application perspective, it feels a very weird niche between monolith, serverless, distributed monolith, microservices. It's a very strange term that doesn't really attach itself uh, to those particular places. So I wanted to go over what I think is a really fun way to build them. It's really about services being grouped together. And it's okay if your service is a single app. It could be a single Lambda, which is a Lambda lith or a monolith being a one Lambda. It could be a bunch of Lambdas, an S3 bucket, a bunch of step functions, a couple SQS queues, some DLQs, a few dynamo tables you know, strung in there. It doesn't matter. The point is that you have a single embeddable unit, single deployable unit that you could still independently deploy things. And you can use SAM, uh, the CDK, the CloudFormation CLI. It doesn't matter. But the point is you have a single thing. So when we're talking about building serverless applications or what AWS calls land applications, think of it as a single unit and a single monitor repo. And there's some advantages and disadvantages to that. If you what what value it provides is that you still have 50 tabs open to see all your stuff on console, but the point is that a lot of them will link back to your app. You'll have a single place, a single tab to start from in the beginning of the day, and so it's a little easier to manage. You know, all your stuff spread out all over the place from Amazon because it's nice to have small deployable units, but keeping track of them is just really hard. And so if you want to visualize it yourself, you can go into the AWS services grouped into uh, a unit, go into the AWS console for lambdas. Most people go here and filter. They're looking for their services, some other services. If you're in a shared account, it's really worse. Mine, it, it, my particular account is like in the thousands and takes forever. Um, but if you look on the left there, you can see that thing says application. So when you click that, that's what loads whatever application or applications that you have for your particular AWS account and what you've deployed. And when you click those, it actually gives you a list of everything in there. It's not just lambdas. It gives you your S3 bucket, your step functions, your Dynamo, everything. It shows what deployments were done and what rollbacks were done and things like that. And it also shows a single place to monitor it. And you can tweak you know, what the charts are showing up there. It's still not as cool as like something like Datadog, for example, but it's getting there. And so it's nice to have a single place to see all your stuff, what inline you know, IAM roles and policies are there. And then when you click those lambdas, they know that they're attached to this app, so you can link back. It's, it's a really nice you know, user experience from a developer perspective. All right, so that's what AWS applications are. They're just all your existing AWS stuff you're deploying in a single place. Let's talk about the main part of this Prezo, which is around error handling for putting those things together and wiring them together and debugging them and feeling confident you know what's wrong if they go. So I, this is just something I made up to feel smart. It, it's not formal at all. It's just from my experience of seeing the different levels of error handling, and each one is not necessarily better than the other. It's more about appropriate use, but I still feel like I would love to live on level five and six. But one is basically ignore them. That's what dynamic languages are really good at. You just quickly compile, run, go, 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 run your code. Level two would be like try, catch, throw. So if some areas you don't want to know about, like analytics, if it breaks you don't want to know about that just log it like i don't care it doesn't affect the app so you would still catch that right but there's not much you can recover if you can't load data go and lua style start treating functions as did they work or not as their values pipeline styles when you wind like weld all these things together and at the end either success comes out or if any part breaks an error comes out so it simplifies the error handling for that 
And it's very, a lot easier to follow that imperative style of what's going on. And then pipeline style leads it to pattern matching. So once you bring types and different outcomes, you can pattern match. And it's a more powerful way of doing if statements and error handling because they come values. And so this is kind of a slow overview. We're not going to cover the entire thing in this phrase just because I don't really have a, uh, enough time to it would take about three hours. But the point is we're going to get a bunch of data around asteroids and munge them together from different satellites that the Jet Propulsion Labs from NASA, they actually offer. And some of those satellites no longer have any fuel left, so they're up there floating, not collecting data, but we still have the data sets and there's actually other new ones. So we're going to pull that data together, merge it together, and then at the end, put that in the dynamo from an active active perspective. So that's kind of the high level we're trying to accomplish with these four or five lambdas. So I'm going to cover the lambda basics because this is something that it took me six months to really get what AWS wanted me to do. They didn't really provide a lot of guidance in terms of developing for these things. They use terms like function. You're like, oh, I know what that is. And then you try to deploy an express app to Lambda and it's like, well, it's stateless. That doesn't really make sense. And so I wanted to cover these things because I I thought they were just so fundamentally important, it bears repeating. So they're based on lambda calculus, which basically means one input, one output. And if you have a function with two outputs, you have to nest them very similar to Lisp or you know, lots of parentheses. So it's a function. It's not a microservice. So if anybody says you're creating microservices, it, it, it was because this was popularized by REST developers who link these things to APIs. But not all of us are linking lambdas to REST APIs. There's a lot of different triggers that can make these things happen. And AWS manages it, so all you focus on is writing code, which is why it's so amazing, which is why I've got, I'm awful at DevOps. When I'm in interviews, yes, I'm full stack and I can do DevOps and Jenkins. But when I'm not <laughs> in interviews, I'm like, I hate it. I would rather somebody else manage it. Um, so when we talk about a basic Python Lambda, we see the function has an input, which is the event. And that in a dynamic language is great because you don't care what it is. It could be anything. That's what's so wonderful about dynamic languages. When you print that event, it immediately goes to CloudWatch. So you can use your native you know, prints or console.log or whatever. And whatever you return, that data goes to whoever's listening for it. So those three core concepts are extremely, extremely important because they build on everything that it really offers. And when you think about triggers or invocation of a function, it's anything on Amazon. It could be API gateway when somebody types in a URL in a browser. It could be S3, somebody drops files on a bucket. The event bridge, which is like the new event bus that used to be in CloudWatch. This, it, they all give you different JSONs. So that event's completely different JSON. And the cool thing about dynamic languages is, is that you just can read from it maybe or not. And if you want to see what they look like, AWS SAM allows you to generate these for local fixtures. So if you just want to unit test or just play with it. But the point is, at the end of it, the Lambda is supposed to either work or not. But there's a lot of nuance there about if it works or not. Because sometimes it doesn't return a value. It blows up. <laughs> All right. So when people got first into this, they said, you know, how do I run AWS locally? And, and they would immediately <laughs> reach for Docker. And the last thing I ever want to do in my career is reach for Docker or CSS. And so this kind of concept of running your code locally is it's just your code. It's just a function. So Python, you literally write your code. And then at the bottom there, you can see that if name equals main, that's a way for Python to run when you go Python the file. But if somebody imports it, that code won't run. So you can put it in Jenkins, you can put it on AWS, and your code will never run. That's just for you to play with it locally. And if you run unit tests, that code won't run. So it's a really nice way to run your code locally. And what you're running locally runs the same way in AWS. So it makes you, you know, have a lot of confidence. It's very fast. And same thing with JavaScript. You can name that stuff on the bottom. And you notice like the event I give it is just an empty dictionary and JavaScript case an empty object. So a really simple way to play with these things. They, they don't have to be these complicated you know, gigantic build systems. You don't need Docker to run this stuff. And from a unit test perspective, as long as you're not using any third-party dependencies and start using dependency injection, you don't even need mocks. So you can just run PyTest or Mocha or whatever and unit test your lambdas with the JSON input and whatever the heck you send outwards, right? So that's from a unit test perspective. So let's cover Delta V. Delta V is how much velocity it takes to get something in space or turn in space. And we're gonna use this as an example to show level one and level two error handling. And a lot, if you think about delta velocity is really going in a straight line and then turning, that's, that's really what 
it matters. It's not about the size of the rock or whatever else, because once you know the Delta V, you can start doing, all right, how much does it cost to get to that big rock in space? And then you either mine it or bring it back. That's what we're, we mean by Delta V. And if you look, there's a lot of different types of tables and CSV data out there. But at the end of the day, they have what the designation is for this asteroid because some just don't have names. And so these Binner equations are an example of the different asteroids you know, near us, really far away. Some are extra solar, actually like outside beyond Pluto. And what is the delta V that it costs to get there? And then some of them have masses and makeup of the asteroids. So you can kind of do a reasonable projection of what minerals do they have? What, what value do they have? Do they have gold, platinum, what silicon, what's there, right? So we're going to parse that particular table and these are occasionally updated. So we have a URL, we open it and we get the data back. That's a string. And so right now we're just trying to test and see this code run and we don't care. There's no error handling whatsoever. And then once we get that string data and print it out, we verify it, we can parse it. And so that parsing, all it does is extract the actual CSV table data into a CSV file because we don't care about all the rest of the HTML around it, right? So if you, the, once you have that, you can throw it on S3 and then later, S3 is like a hard drive in the sky if you don't know. You can take that, all that data that you're going to parse from the hard drive and then munge them together later. And so S3 is a really wonderful way to store files, read them later, massive size. And if you don't have a database, it's a great quick way to get things done. And that last thing is really important if you've ever done any eventual consistency on S3 because it helps you actually have the hash of the file. So if you have to read it, you can verify you're reading the right one. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong in this function. You're reading a URL from some third-party jet propulsion website, you're parsing CSV data, and you're assuming that you have access to go to some random bucket. There's a lot of things that could possibly break here. You don't have a guarantee that e-tag exists on that dictionary. A lot of things that could break. But what we're concerned about really is what's your fault and what's their fault? Because what's their fault could be retried, could be caught, could be tried again, right? Sometimes there's other things you can do about it. So what we're interested from level one and level two is really just try catching on the things that aren't our fault so we can signal to others that, hey, they should probably try again. They might have to wait a second, but that's that point. The bottom stuff, if it breaks, you want to fail fast, you can fix it, and that's cool. So we're... We're talking about errors. If you're a functional programmer, think of these as types, okay? I know that using exceptions is blasphemy, but if you're an OOP or object-oriented programming or an imperative developer, these are custom errors that allow you to signal in a language, their fault, my fault, right? And that way, those who consume you know what to actually do, what kind of action to take. So in Python, you just literally make a class that's passed, and JavaScript, you just extend to error. And we're going to wrap that one with a try catch. So we get the result of it, but we're going to raise a very custom exception for HTTP failure. So that way we, we signal others. That's not my fault. If you would like to retry, go for it. Um, everything on the bottom, do fix it. Like it's literally three lines. Now you look at this code and this is just a, a point around microservices. A lot of people think, why would you want to have many lambdas rather than a lambda lith? If you're learning serverless, lambda lists, monoliths are great. They are the best way to learn. That's the way I learned. Once you start realizing that whether you're using serverless or using servers or whatever, code does this thing called grow and you cannot stop it. That's why a lot of these old crusty developers say, I love deleting code because it's impossible. It's impossible to delete code after a while. So what you do is you start small and you guarantee they, they're going to grow. You can't stop it, but at least they don't get so big because you started small. So this four lines of code already has grown to like six or seven, mm -hmm. right? So anyway, that, that error is important. Using step functions, a, a lot of this serverless stuff became very, very difficult to orchestrate, to call, and it was a lot of just very indeterministic stuff. If you ever looked at all the reactive architectures, they talk about uh, um, you know, event-based architectures, event sourcing, CQRS, and it's kind of like you, you light a fuse and it just kind of runs on its own. There's like no way to control it, and everyone you know, lauded this as a wonderful way to build apps, but... I, as someone who's a you know has control issues, I I I loved the concept of orchestration, and that's where I, I fell in love with Node because I would go into these you know companies that had all these APIs, and we would use Node to kind of orchestrate what we needed for the front end, or just make a new API that was you know the data we wanted, versus waiting six months for somebody to make a patch, right? And so step functions were kind of created to 
orchestrate all this stuff, but in a very deterministic way. And so that's why I love it. So we're going to use this as to illustrate why that level two of try catch can, can really help here. So the, if you don't know about step functions, they've, they are my favorite thing in my life for the past two years. They're mostly a finite state machine. Finite state machines are what we all try to do in programming. Like it either works or it doesn't, but then we have this third thing that magically appears where it doesn't. And so that's why step functions also kind of do that because they don't have the best error handling, but they're getting there. You write in JSON with some inline functions. It's called JSON path. So it, it looks like JSON, but it has a little extra set of features and AWS has pared it down a little bit. It's made for orchestrating things. So lambdas, batch, servers, message systems, whatever. It's, it's supposed to be the dude who controls all of it. And it, it, it's, but the reason it has a function in its name is because it takes an input and has an output, just like Lambda functions. The real reason a lot of us in big companies like it is because of the catch and retry with exponential back off. Anytime you're technically tack, uh, technical debt, sometimes systems go down. You want to retry and encourage that it doesn't break your system. You have blast radius protection. And so these two features are what really is really compelling about step functions. Um, and it can run for a year and that's good and bad. <laughs> you don't want to know your code's broken for a year, but that it's, it's compelling because the point is I can wait. I don't care how long the server's down for, I can wait. That's the compelling thing about it. The nomenclature, just a quick review. If you don't know, execution is when you invoke a step function, it's running. So if you look at five times, you have five executions. The input is either string, JSON, whatever. As long as it's JSON supported, you can make that as an input and an output, okay? The output is whatever comes out. And it could be a bunch of lambdas that mangle stuff. could be a batch. Who knows? The definition is what it is the JSON that makes up your step function. So when you say, like, what's your definition? It's like the JSON that illustrates this visual step function. State is any one of those boxes that you go through a step function. And the transition is going between those boxes. And so when I say state, like the step function manages where it is, what function is running. You don't have to manage any of that stuff. So if you're a functional programmer, this should make you so unbelievably excited. If you're an OOP developer, you're like, okay, whatever, which is fun. Data is the JSON that travels through, and they have a lot of powerful ways to tweak it. So this is a basic step function. If you look to the left under that definition, you can see that it has a type of pass. That just means, cool, it worked, and the result is whatever you return. So to give you a visual comparison, if you were to write this in Python, you can't currently, but it'd be so awesome if you could. If you look at the left, it, it says, I have a state of hello cow, and I'm going to return to this value. If you were to write that in Python, the input would be whatever you invoked it with and whatever it comes out with in this, the output, right? And that's, that's generally how it works. And while you can create your own executions, step functions are just like everything else in AWS, especially Lambda, is that you can invoke them with other services. You, you can use CloudWatch, you can use S3. So very similar triggers to, to launch and invoke Lambda functions. Step functions can be invoked the same way. Um, sometimes they can invoke themselves. You can do recursion with them, which sometimes helps if you're running low on event history things. And so you can see the, the wonderful thing about step functions more than any other infrastructure in AWS is that they have built-in monitoring. You can very quickly say, oh, this worked because <laughs> it's green. You can look at that one and go, okay, it worked. You don't need Datadog or monitoring or dashboards or SNS topics. Like you just immediately can see it worked and click on it and see what the input and output is. So it's a really nice way to view, you know, did your code work or not? I wish a lot of programming environments were this transparent. And the input, you can see what your step function took as an input and as an output. So very similar to functions, you can see what it came out with because a lot of times this stuff will change drastically based on what services you have in there. Now, if you have two of these states, think of it as like functions calling functions. Step functions will orchestrate that calling for you. They'll orchestrate, you know, the passing that data. Um, you, if you look at the bottom, we have an intentional one called fail, which is almost the same thing as raise in Python or throw in any other language where you have errors. And it'll handle those errors and show you those errors and let you know if it worked or didn't work. And so you'll, you'll look at the code off to the right kind of to illustrate how it would work if you were to write it in Python. Again, you can't do it currently, but it just helps you visualize how they actually run from a programming perspective. And so here, it's cool. Did it work or not? No, it broke on Hello Boom. How many fire drills have you spent five minutes trying to figure out what's wrong in production? Where here, it's like, oh, that broke. <laughs> like you can immediately see it. It's so great. And if you click the exception on the bottom right, you can see what exception it threw and why it broke. And you, you can oftentimes have a direct link to the CloudWatch logs for that particular service. Could be a Lambda, a batch, whatever. So really, really wonderful way when you're failing fast to very quickly see what 
what went wrong. So we're going to wire this up to an actual Lambda function. This is going to wire up to the download Binner equations, Python that we just wrote. And it's going to utilize that error to handle the fact that if it doesn't work. And so here we're running it. You can see that they're asynchronous by default. So all step functions can take as long as you need up to a year to run. And if you look at this one in particular, it's blue. And that means it's currently running. So that we're waiting for that Lambda to go to that website, download the data and parse it. And when it's done, you can see that the output is that hash that we returned from the Lambda function. So the step function can get those return values of whatever your service is, not just Lambdas, but anything. And it's there. And I think the cool thing is if you look at from a, an in the end test perspective, because you're not really going to unit test step functions. You could if you wanted to. They have a, I think it's a Docker container you can run locally, but anything that has, you know, Docker and I'm like, peace, I'm out. So in this case, you can just run, you know, Python behave test or a Mocha test or whatever. And do an in test and functional test very quickly for your step functions. You treat them like a regular function. And so I've kind of got a, if you look at that output there, that start and wait, it's just a wrapper around, you know, waiting for the execution to run. But you can treat it like very functional programming. I have a function, I give it an input, I assert on the output. So really, really cool testable way to do in end tests. And if you're going to do a bunch of these, I highly encourage you to do the async version. So if you haven't done async IO in Python, it allows you to run a lot of these things concurrently uh, in the end test even to this day, still have a bad reputation for being slow. So anything you can do to speed it up and do, you know, running a bunch of step functions at once, then use the async await syntax for Python or, in, you know, node, whatever you're using. It's just a, a minor way to help speed up a lot of your tests. So retry is, is one of the main things that if you're an enterprise developer, you fall in love with because you're dealing with either, you know, cloud migration projects, mainframe migration projects, or just a code base that's been around for 15 years, had a series of contractors, and nobody loves it. And so it has nothing but technical debt. It always breaks, and no one knows why. But sometimes it works. And so retry can help with that. And so if you look at errors equals, you can think of that as like when a try catch. You can put as many error types as you want in there. I just put states all, which basically means any error ever. right? Interval seconds means how long are we going to wait? Like if it breaks, we're going to breathe and then try again. Max attempts is how many times are we gonna retry? So a lot of times at the enterprise, that's gonna be 3000 <laughs> because things break forever. <laughs> but three is just an example. Uh, back off rate is how long do you sl slow down? So at first you wait a second. Oh, maybe we're getting throttled. Okay, let's wait two seconds. Man, that web server is really overloaded. Maybe we should wait three seconds, right? Or four. So that back off rate is exponential. Over time, it'll multiply that by the interval seconds. And I built a calculator for this math because I'm horrible at math. So it helps me visualize this. So we're going to put that retry and I'm going to manually hard code a URL as like cow or something. And so that way you can see that error from that Lambda and then retry multiple, multiple times. Now, if you look, it says it failed and you can see that the exception, but we don't know how many times it, like, did it work? Like, is there any way to see what it did? What's the visibility? So if you scroll to the bottom, you can see something called the execution history because it's a finite state machine. It has very clear steps to go from state to state, those transitions. It's very deterministic. And so you can see, if you look at those numbers that it tried, failed, waited a second, tried, failed, waited two seconds, and then again, waited eight seconds. And so that math is kind of done for you. It's not exact because there's some latency in invoking Lambda functions, things like that. But you can see that that history there of exactly what happened. And each one of those steps shows you as your JSON and data changes over time, if there's any errors and if it recovered. And all that state of like trying again, that's all managed for you. You don't have to code any of that. And like step function has no server, so it doesn't like go down in the middle of this stuff. It's really, really cool stuff. All right, so that's level one and two. Try catch, looking at it from a step function and retrying. Let's talk about the Go style, which really, I think, revolutionized a lot of people's thoughts about error handling. If, if you don't know about Go, it's just what it does is it doesn't have classes, it just has functions, but it returns multiple values from a function. And the convention is that you return true. The first is an error, if you had one. The second is data, if you have any. And the caller of that function checks, is the error not equal to nil or none or null and undefined, right? If it is, it immediately returns and stops. And so what this results in is code that's very imperative that you can read and all functions do two things. They either work or they don't. And that's it. So when you combine a program made of functions that work or don't work, then your program either works or it doesn't work. And if it doesn't, you can very clearly find it very similar to a stack trace, except in this case, it's like a line of code in a function. 
And so Air Alien Python supports this style very easily because of the, the tuples and destruction abilities that it has when you're calling them. So if you look at trying to do that style in um, using, if you use like MyPy, for example, for types, it's up on the top right, you can see the tuple has an exception or anything. You would turn a tuple with two values and the errors first, if any, or the value. And then same thing for if you have an error, you just return the exception first and then nothing for the second. People consuming it literally just structure it. You get those two values from that function and your code in Python starts to look eerily similar to Go. The types aren't as powerful, obviously, but it, it's very clear to follow. So people who like imperative programming and like that Go style of error handling, it's nice because then all the functions become a lot easier to test because they're just you know asserting on values, inputs and outputs. So if we go from an exoplanet perspective where we're downloading even more data, that download function either works or it doesn't. It could be it downloaded it or it could be it downloaded it, but it couldn't parse it, right? Whatever reason it is, that's not, that's their fault. It's not my fault. My fault would be trying to upload it, trying to parse it and things like that. And so we have two distinct errors, their fault, my fault, and we have a way to actually do that from a type perspective. So HTTP error, go ahead and retry, general error, fail early. There's a, you know, our code's busted deploy, deploy. And so a lot of what you're going to do with these errors is like, okay, but how do I interface with code that I didn't write or doesn't follow that style? Well, you have this thing called try catch or try accept. <laughs> so everything can be wrapped in a try accept. And it's very clear if the function worked or not. And the AWS SDK is amazing at this because they follow the Python methodology of raising exception if it doesn't work or, you know, returning the value if it does. So it's really easy to integrate from that perspective. Um, now, when we talk about, let's see if I want to do, yeah, parallelism. So parallelism, I can't pronounce the word, so go ahead and make fun of me. It basically means doing many things at once. And set functions have two ways to do it. And the reason that's important is if you've ever done asynchronous code, sometimes you need a bunch of things to happen at once, and there's no reason they need to happen in a line, right? They can all have at the same time to get data. And so a lot of our media data or asteroid data is pulling from different data sources all at the same time. And we don't really care what order, we just want to wait for the end. And so step functions allow you to do that. Now, if you've ever done like, let's say promise.all in JavaScript or the async await syntax with gather in Python, they do all those things at one time. And at the end, they guarantee that when it's done, they're all done. And they gave you an order that you added the data that came back. So it solves a lot of that really hard asynchronous problems for you but it doesn't handle the retry and things like that, which the step function does. So if one fails, it could possibly succeed if you were just to wait, right? It, it, it's not fair that that one dude broke everybody else. And so it doesn't really have that kind of stuff built in. What step function parallels do. So if you look, you can see the retry tag in the top and bottom one. If any of them fail, it, it attempts to retry again. So it really helps increase the likelihood that your code's gonna work simply by just retrying, but still handles you know, all the async things and all the weird uh, you know, asynchronous issues you could run into. And so it looks like this, it's it basically a single task. Each one will get the same exact JSON input, but at the output, it's gonna be an array, just like you would in Python or JavaScript. And so that array has the data that they returned and using the JSON tools that set functions, you can you know mangle and play with that JSON as it comes out if you need different data types. All right, so. Now that you understand the basic of error handling from try catch, throwing errors that others can determine, what do I do with this error? Is this my fault? Should I retry? Pipelines really help simplify a lot of what your lambdas are doing, even if they're doing many different things, into either it worked or not, because you're composing these things and you're going to do the same thing in step functions. So pipelines mean like a lot of pipeline-based program or railway programming is popularized in F sharp. At the end of the day, it's very similar to Go. It either worked or it didn't. And so result a very popular one. Functional programmers call them either, but nobody can remember what's the difference between left or right. It's just, it's a stupid name. I don't care what anybody says. So results better because you know if it worked or not. Succeed or failure, it's very clear. And so it's like the Go style, but you can chain them together. So you don't have all this imperative, like if it worked, return, if it worked, return. Like it handles doing all that stuff for you. Bottom line is there's no manual checking for error. You don't have to write all that. So if you think of the, I, th I think it's called dry Python slash returns. It's a library that makes a lot of this stuff a lot easier. There's two ways to do it. You can either manually do it with the try accept or try catch way of doing it and then return that success or failure. Or you can just put the at, the at safe decorator annotation and it handles all that for you. So it makes your code very safe. You know, either it worked or not and it's always gonna return that. And then you can pipe them together 
And if you think of creating each function as a single input, single output, you create these like pipes or connections together and it just flows right through. And even more amazing is that if you use MyPy, you actually get strong typing on what those results are as they change between data types, between functions. It's a really, really cool concept. So not only you get strong typing, but you actually know what the heck's coming out of 15 pipes that you wired together. And again, error handling is in one spot. Okay, so functional programming is cool and you get these results out, but that's not what step function speaks. It speaks JSON or errors. So there's this thing called unwrap. So if you use the unwrap function, it basically says, all right, here's your data or explosion, right? And if you did the right explosion, actually inside your, your failure, then you can actually strongly type on that in your step function for your error. And so a lot of people also look at these, these pipelines and go, wait a minute, what if my function has more than one parameter? Well, if you use partial applications, you can pre-fill those parameters ahead of time. And I think the Python actually has a lot of this stuff built in now. You don't have to use like curry and all that other insanity. So no JS streams, very similar concept. If, if you have cyber concerns, like I do, where a lot of security, where we're reading files that are either bigger than 500 megs, right? Bigger than Lambda allows, or they're like gigs and they're bigger than the, the memory that Lambda has. And you're not allowed to write it to disk. You can't even write it to like EFS if you mount that to your Lambda. Then cool, stream it. And stream is the same way. You have these pipelines, they have errors, and it's in a single place and they either spit out i worked or they spit out explosion and here's why it's my fault their fault some downstream system whatever and so think you still have the same api that comes out of those those pipes so there's another way to do concurrency though and this is probably one of the second most powerful things about a step function when you're dealing with systems that you have to obey slas or service level agreements where you have to you know call maybe three two TPS or a thousand TPS or respond on a certain time. It's like a for loop, but it's all at once. So instead of parallel getting a copy of all the data, each state will get its own item of the data. So it could be any state. It could be a Lambda, a batch, another step function, whatever you want. And each one of those items is given what you spit out comes back in the other array. So if, if you know anything about functional programming, like a map, for example, a map is, it's going to call that whatever function you gave it for each item in the array and replace that index in the exact same spot with whatever you return. And so that cook could be a Lambda function that takes that data. It could be a batch. It could be anything you want. And it's going to create a bunch of those. Now, generally, that's kind of cool that it, it does that. The problem is if you have, like, let's say, 400 items of these 400 asteroids, if we load from the JPL database, there's a quarter of a million. That's a high write capacity. You're looking at like $32,000 a minute in Dynamo if you set your write capacity that high, right? So instead, you can set the concurrency to a lot lower. And in promises, like in JavaScript or in a way, there's no way to do concurrency limits. I think JavaScript Bluebird has a way to do it. But like, if you have a thousand things, it's going to run all thousand at the same time. There's no way to run three at a time or whatever else, right? So from a concurrency perspective on, on that, you literally set my concurrency. And that way, with a single item, you can say 100 and only do 100 at a time. Uh, if Dynamo starts giving you a hot partition and you need to retry, which they actually encourage, or you're doing active active where you're doing conditional puts right to Dynamo and you're, it's going to run right to both regions. Sometimes that's slow. And so it'll, you know, have the retry built in for you. So step functions manage all of that. It'll do a hundred at a time, never go above that. And this really helps for, you know, Dynamo downstream services, whatever. And so if you look, although you would normally write a Lambda function for this, I'm actually calling Dynamo directly in the step function. And it's going to create a hundred or a thousand of these right single asteroids of Dynamo, but only run a hundred at a time or whatever your max concurrency is. So really, really powerful, awesome feature. All right. So level five, this is the last error handling level you can get to beyond going to state monads, but we're not going to cover that. So pattern matching error handling basically means the world isn't black and white. <laughs> like not everything in the world is I worked or I didn't. Sometimes there's like, dude, I worked, but like the data's, you know, the same. There's no new asteroids in the past five seconds you ran, crackhead. Or what if NASA servers are down? Like I can't even run. Or my cache was invalidated, I have no data. Or Dynamo's down. Like you have the data, but you can't write. These are actual things that can happen and they're not errors. They're just the fact of life. <laughs> so you type for them, right? So instead of raising and thrower, you can use compilers to help with this kind of stuff. So for example, an Elm or Rescript or any other type language, uh, even TypeScript, they have types that define what are the you know, things that could happen. So if you think of an object allows you to do any property, a dictionary allows you to add any value you want. Types are the opposite. You only have four and that's it, right? Or only these. 
And so you can do it in TypeScript too. It just takes like four slides, but whatever. Um, if you look at the, the pattern matching, it, you can guarantee that like a switch statement, if you think of a switch statement, it guarantees you don't miss one. And so these are the types of things that can happen. A server's down, I don't have any new data, the Dynamo's down, whatever. And these are like known things we look for. Now, obviously we don't want Dynamo to be down and we hope it would retry, but that's okay. Same with Elm, you can just pattern match any things, the compiler will tell you. And if you want to do the same thing in TypeScript, you just have to turn use strict on and add types to your switch statement. And so now we can map for this. So if anything breaks in upstream, we have these four eventualities that come out, right? And so they're just things we expect. We don't want to blow up. We just want to collect a report on it. So the step state, like the step function is not always going to work or not. It's going to work and errors would be extraneous things like an IM role broke or you misparse something or had a bad deployment. We want it to always work and always show success, but show a result. And that's what we're really passing on is what is the result? So in conclusion, what I really wanted to point out about AWS and Lambda applications really changed my life because I now have a single browser tab that can manage all this stuff. I can have a mono repo instead of 50 GitHub repos, but I can still independently deploy if I want to, and I can still roll back. If you want to do green, blue, you can do that. If you want to do you know, slow canary deployments, you can do that too. And all the AWS tools support it, including those weirdos like Terraform and Ansible. Um, from an error handling perspective, you create custom errors at, at a minimum to throw. But if you try to only throw it in a handler, that way you don't have to look over a whole code base. Um, you obviously should strive for no exceptions and pattern matching, but it's a, it's, it's a level and it's hard. So at least try with a basic try catch of customs. Um, watch out for high retries. It sounds cool at first, but you want to know your stuff's broken early. You don't want to wait forever. Uh, there's nothing worse than debugging for six hours to realize you could have solved it in 10 minutes. Uh, timeout seconds, use it liberally. Although every Lambda and Batch and EC2 has timeouts, it's good to use that. Um, An X-ray will change your life. Set that up first, then do your performance tests. Um, so if you've got any questions, I've got a ton of links here. I'll share the presentation links so you have these links. This can You can learn more. Asteroid, um, price ranking at Asterank is where I really got uh, inspiration for a lot of this stuff. And the rest of this stuff will teach you about functional programming and error handling. So, yeah, so thank you very much. I hope you learned, you're pumped to use uh, step functions and lambdas. And did, there was no questions in the middle, so I'm assuming there's questions at the end, maybe. All right, Jesse, thank you very much. Yeah, the questions in the middle is that I'm not going to interrupt you, so I'll just let you do your, uh, <laughs> okay. just let you do your thing. Uh, you have a nice voice, by the way. I know it's probably maybe weird to say, but you have a really, uh, really cool voice. People are saying that you're a rock star, so that's always good. The Slavics were were very explicit. They said, "Get a mic. Your mic's horrible." So I was like, "Okay, I'll get a mic." <laughs> well, you did a great job, and I'm sitting here with my uh, my ear uh, ear tingy. Anyway, if we can understand each other, I'm looking at uh, someone is saying I'm pumped to use Go. So uh, normally I would say I'll, I'll also <laughs> ask some questions, but I'm going to be honest. You're getting a lot of applause. So people are, are clapping. So I have the clap emojis. Uh, I'm looking at the chat because most of the time there's a, there's a slight delay after 13, 13 seconds delay. So if people are asking questions, I'm probably going to get it a bit later. So if you have questions for Jesse, ask them now. Now is the time to do that. Um, people keep applauding. So that's also good. You're, you're a, a uh, pop who, who is pumped to use Go? Who is pumped to use Go? Pumped to use Go. Let me check real quick. That person needs a hug. Go is the worst. He's going to disappear. I know a lot, a lot of people love that language. Uh, Dominica and the last name, Jakub Kova is, uh, is, is I'm pumped to use Go. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll have a therapy session after this. <laughs> Sorry, it's, it's, it's good to level up beyond Python. So that's good. that's good. There you go. There you go. So last call. Yeah, you're getting a lot of applause. It's always fun as a speaker to know that people are reacting to it uh, and that they're, that they're happy what, what you present it. So that's good coming in. Let me check real quick. Anyone has a question, you can also fill in the poll to let us know what you think about Jesse's presentation, about the, about the speaker in general, uh, and if it was useful. And like I said, I started the introduction and you're probably gonna delete it <laughs> after, after this speech. But I started with the programming, gaming, fitness, Jesse Borden. And if you have no clue what about that, yeah, there you go. Go check out his YouTube channel. Go check out jessewarden.com. Uh, check in the chat real quick. No, everybody's just really excited, but they're not asking any questions. Um, and like I said, that's okay. They can connect with you later on. So what I want to do, Jesse, I don't know what time it is where you're at right now. 
it's it's uh, beer time. It's beer time. So enjoy the beer. <laughs> enjoy the rest. <laughs> yeah, some people will call it, uh, dial in at the middle of the night. Some they start their day. So wherever, what time you are, beer time. Enjoy the beer. Thank you for being here. Uh, and if you want to connect with Jesse, do it afterwards. Uh, we enjoyed it. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.